Today is June 12th, 2023, and my guest is entrepreneur and venture capitalist Mark Andreessen, co-founder and general partner of Silicon Valley venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, sometimes known as A16Z. This is Mark's third appearance on Econ Talk. He was last year in May of 2022 discussing software immortality and Bitcoin. Mark, welcome back to Econ Talk. Good morning, Russ. Thanks for having me back. Our topic for today is your recent essay, Why AI Will Save the World. Uh, you recently posted it on the A16Z website, and of course, we will link to that. Uh, you argue that AI, artificial intelligence, will make everything better if we let it. A bold claim in current climate. Uh, give us some examples and why you're optimistic that that is the path we're on. Yeah, so the reason I'm so optimistic is because we know for a fact, you know, as sort of one of the most settled conclusions in all of science, we know for a fact that in human affairs, intelligence makes everything better. And I, I want to, by, by, by everything, I mean basically every outcome of human welfare uh, and life quality that, you know, that, that essentially we can measure. And so uh, higher uh, people who are of higher intelligence, um, you know, exhibit everything from uh, higher levels of physical health, higher levels of educational attainment, higher levels of career success. Uh, more success parenting. Um, by the way, they are also uh, less bigoted. They are better at conflict resolution. They are less violent. Um, they, um, you know, are more capable of solving problems. They are more capable of doing everything from creating art to, uh, you know, to to new science, discovering drugs. You know, there, there's this long litany. There's, you know, been been studies on this for a very long time, and there's hundreds and hundreds of such conclusions. Um, and they all correlate to the concept known as as fluid intelligence, which is the ability to rapidly um, uh, assimilate um, and, and synthesize knowledge and, and and then use knowledge to to, to solve problems. Um, this has, of course, been a, a domain of, of of humanity for for the last you know for for the last <laughs> many millennia, um, and it's been the uh, you know long sought dream of computer scientists going back to the first uh, original invention of the computer in the 1940s to uh, you know have computers be able to think and reason in ways at least similar to how humans can do it. Um, and it seems that we've finally reached the point where that that technology is actually starting to work. And so now we have the opportunity um, to consider the application of machine intelligence to all of the various problems of humanity um, as, a, as as what I would describe as an augmentation to human intelligence, which is the actual you know practical application of machine intelligence to human affairs. Uh, do you think it's it, meaning whatever we want to call AI, obviously there's different terminologies and what's in the air right now is – a thing that finishes sentences um, and thereby is able to do some amazing things uh, all of a sudden. I think it's going to get dramatically better. Um, a lot of people think it's going to get unimaginably better. If Do you agree with that? And if so, how is that going to happen? So – so I should start by saying I'm not I'm not a utopian. Um, I'm not a believer in what Thomas Sowell called the unconstrained vision. Um, notwithstanding the title of the essay, I'm not a uh, you know I'm not I'm not a uh, what I would characterize as a sort of a, a utopian and extremist on these things. And so I, you, you might differentiate what I'm about to say from the scenarios in which it like becomes overwhelmingly powerful overnight and those kinds of things. That's not what I'm proposing. Um, but as a technologist, what I and, and as somebody now who's been involved in sort of watching and being involved in the trajectory of how technology has improved for you know for basically for 30 years professionally. Um, I, what's happening right now is a very large percentage of the world's very smart engineers and entrepreneurs are now, or if they weren't already doing this, now they're doing this. Um, and, and, you know, and this is, this is actually the story of Silicon Valley. This is kind of what Silicon Valley does, right? The reason we're called Silicon Valley is because there was a point at which we did this for the microchip. And then we did this for several other ways of, of technology. And what happens each time is a small group of people get something to work. And then the minute that happens, that's like firing the starting gun to be able to get all of these other smart people to, to to participate. And then all these other smart people basically come in and they take a look at the technology and they say, okay, here are the you know 14 things that it's not doing well yet. And here are the 18 problems that are preventing it from being widely adopted. And, and then they solve those problems. Um, and so I, I think the rate of technological improvement from here is going to be very rapid. And, and by the way, as evidence of that, there are there are breakthroughs happening essentially every week right now. Um, there's this phenomenon in AI where people aren't getting much sleep because there are so many research papers coming out with so many fundamental breakthroughs in, in engineering, at the very least in engineering, and, and then in some cases in the actual science, um, that, it, that it seems like it's going gonna, it's gonna to move uh, uh, very quickly from here. But the, the way it moved very quickly to get to this point was by wandering through trillions of pieces of language on the web. What's going to be the technique? Sam Allman recently said, now it's not recently. He's like, was this, this is like a month ago, it was so long ago that the pace is going to decelerate because we've exhausted 
the the size of the sample trick, and we're going to find new stuff. Are they finding new stuff since then? Well, I mean, that's what you'd want to say if you had an early lead and you wanted to convince other people to, you know, maybe back off a little bit and give you <laughs> give you room to run. So I, you know, I maybe maybe he, maybe he's putting a little English on the ball. Um, actually, his colleagues, he has two colleagues, uh, Greg Brockman and Ilya Sutskever, who are respectively the head of I think head of engineering and CTO of um, uh, of, of OpenAI. And they they have given many, actually, several interesting uh, YouTube t- talks that are available on YouTube. And I think they're in addition to Sam, I would listen to their their talks because they actually outline a lot of the future research direction. Um, I, look, I think it's going to move. I think it's going to move quickly. I, I, let me just give you one, one, one sort of piece of context on this, which is there actually was a theoretical breakthrough uh, that happened quite recently, and this is the invention of this algorithm called the transformer, um, which is a, a sort of a, a, which is sort of the form of the neural net that it turns out actually works, um, you know, in, in, a, in this sort of generalized way. And that that only happened in 2017, and then Google interestingly kind of let that sit on the shelf uh, for several years, and then that's the technology that OpenAI picked up and implemented. And so a big part of why I'm so confident on what's about to happen is because like we've just had that breakthrough. Um, now that people know that works, they're going to try, you know, the way the way people do, they're going to try thousands of variations on that. You know, we, we we may still have decades of architectural breakthroughs ahead of us on top of being able to, you know, gather and, 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 uh, and program these things with much larger amounts of data. A personal question. How much time do you spend a day reading those papers that you mentioned that are coming out in, in great perfusion? And, and how much of that is is personal consumption for you versus what you feel you need to do to be a successful funder of these of these technologies? Yeah, so for for, for me, it's it's all work. So the the, the sort of the sort of th- the thing I enjoy most about my job is that my you know my job is to actually keep track of all these things. Um, and and then and then and then what's ha- literally I mean this is what's happening right now every day um, is uh, you know entrepreneurs are showing up in our, in our office and and you know with 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 all these new ideas. Um, you know, sometimes the entrepreneurs literally show up with a research paper that somebody wrote. Sometimes it's that researcher showing up to start a company. Um, sometimes it's somebody else who picks up picks up uh, you know something out of a paper, and then you know. And by and by the way, look, there's lots of work happening that's not being published in papers. Um, and so the other the other part of what we do is 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 to actually talk to the practitioners. Um, and so as, as a consequence, maybe you know the sort of unfair advantage that I have in these conversations is I just have the, this this lens on what's happening in real time, and and you know these 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 sharp people who are who are who are um, you know kind of pounding away at at, at all these problems. And and look, it, it, this is not a determinant. You know, this like, it's not a deterministic process, right? There's there's no guarantees um, in, in any of these things. And there and, and look, there have been AI there have been AI booms in the past that did not pay off. Um, but I, you know, I think you correctly identified that there, there is this moment where these products are working in a sort of fundamental, you know, it's just sort of self-evident that these things are working in this sort of breakthrough way. Um, and, and then I, I sort of couple that with my confidence in the, the abilities of the people who are now, as we say, flooding the zone, uh, in this field. Intelligence is kind of obvious when you say it, uh, you, you know, I know a lot of people are smarter than I am in, in some dimension. Uh, what we would normally call IQ or speed of reasoning or uh, ability to see connections that, to things that are not obvious and, and create a aha moment for the listener that they couldn't have come to on their own. Okay. Um, when I ask uh, ChatGPT to write a poem for me or a, a memo or a letter or summarize an article, it's not, I, I'm not sure I would call that that, natu- that nature of, of intelligence that, that, that I was alluding to. I'm curious what you think is is the potential in the future. Meaning, you said it's gonna it it thinks like humans. Now we don't really know how humans think, so that's a generalization, <laughs> or however you worded it. You you could clarify that in a second, but I'm I, I don't understand fully what is the potential is, and I think the the um, evangelists tend to just assume it's really big and without having to worry about those definitions. Do you have any idea of what they're talking about? Yeah, so a bunch of things to go through here that are, I think, really, really central. So first, I, I listened to your recent interview with Tyler, and and um, uh, he was, um, you were saying you're using the free version of ChatGPT, and he was encouraging you to pay the $20 to upgrade to the... And I did. You did, okay. Record. Yes. Okay. And you know, okay, so when you, and then when you use it, I'm just, this is now tech support. We're not doing, we'll do live, the live tech support. So, you know, at, at the top of the window for chat GPT, it lets you pick which model you use. And so you can pick what's called GPT 3.5 or GPT 4. Are you sure you're picking GPT 4? No, I'm not. I'm not paying okay. close attention to that. Good <laughs> okay. point. <laughs> okay, so, so. <laughs> This is actually a way. This is actually a way to get a lens on the on the pace of improvement. This is actually a way to kind of get live insight into this, which is actually, you, if you want, you can, you can start running the same queries through GPT three point five and then GPT four, 
um, a lot of people are fine. A lot of people are finding that even that step function is a dramatic step function. Um, like I'm just finding in my daily life, like the upgrade from GPT 3.5 to four was like very significant in terms of its ability to help me uh, in all of my day-to-day -day work. Um, and so anyway, it's, it's, it's a good way to measure. And then by the way, there are, there are two other kind of free equivalents to this technology actually that, that are fully free. So one is uh, uh, Microsoft has a different version of GPT-4 um, uh, called Bing, uh, which is actually free, um, which by the way, also actually is more advanced in a very interesting way, which it has full integration with the internet. Um, and so it actually has up-to-date knowledge on a lot of things, which GPT-4 does not. Um, and then Google has a thing called BARD, um, which is the, the result of their work, which is, a, it's a little bit behind, but like it's improving fast. I like, Mark, how you're identifying those for me, because once you saw that I didn't pay close attention to the 3.54 thing, you might, you're, you're, you've lowered your expectations for me. I, I, it's a reasonable thing. Keep going. <laughs> so you so you can run these things in a horse race, right? You can and you can actually see the different pros and cons of the uh, of the decisions they're making. So so anyway, that's how to experience this. Um, the way I would describe it is: look, this this is not. It's actually very interesting. This is not human. This is not strictly speaking human intelligence. Um, and and you know the, to start with, like we actually still don't really understand how human intelligence works. Oh, Although there are experts in human intelligence who think we now understand a lot more than we did a year ago because it turns out neural networks actually work better than we thought. Um, but we could come back to that. Um, uh, interestingly, historically, um, the architecture of neural networks that are applied in uh, computers today in GPT-4 are actually based on a paper that was originally written in 1943. Um, and so as far back as 1943, they knew enough about the neural structure of the brain to be able to write a paper basically saying, here's how you build an, an electronic analog. Um, and that is still the basic architecture that's running today. This is one of the reasons why I actually think there's still going to be a lot of advances is because like this, this, this work today is all derivative of basically what happened in 1943. Knowing what we know today now and knowing what we have with modern brain science, like we know a lot more about human brain neurons than we did in 1943. And so it's entirely possible that there are fundamentally better neural network architectures architectures that we will now invent because because we now have a reason to because we know how well that they can work um these are not this is not human intelligence but this is the, this is much much closer to human intelligence than anything we've ever gotten and then when when you use a gpt4 or when i use it um you know you like say you don't experience strictly speaking human intelligence but you exhibit you see something that is like a, a, a lot like it in a lot of domains um and then uh, uh, maybe take one step further which is to say um when you look at human intelligence you actually the way the the psychologists do it is they actually uh, you know the sort of psychometricians they break human intelligence into actually two parts, uh, so-called fluid intelligence, um, which is what they call the G factor or IQ, where the, the G factor for the general factor for intelligence. And that's the general capability to assimilate, synthesize information, use it to solve problems. And then they also talk about crystallized intelligence, which is basically memory, right? Your ability to remember a lot of things. And it turns out those are actually separate. And we know this because there are people who have basically near perfect crystallized intelligence who are not actually higher in fluid intelligence. Like those people, you know, sort of an uncannily good memory does not actually necessarily make you quote unquote smarter. Um, having said that, the interesting thing about a system like GPT-4 is it has both, you know, I would say it has roughly human equivalent IQ fluid intelligence, roughly of about 130, 135. And I can tell you why I, I think we know that. Um, but then, of course, which is sort of analogous to like a, a quite smart person, right? It's analogous to it's probably analogous to the IQ level of basically like, you're, you know, you're basically your typical student, you know, at the, at the university where you are. Um, however, it has, of course, far superior crystallized intelligence uh, to, to any human, right? Be, and because it's a computer. And so it, the other thing that's happening is it just knows about so many more things. And that doesn't translate into a higher level of fluid, fluid intelligence. But when you use it, boy, is it useful uh, because it turns out it knows a lot about everything in a way that any individual person does not. And so you get this, you, you basically, as a, as a user of this, you get this kind of turbo boost of you, you get its fluid intelligence augmenting your own, but you also also gets its crystallized intelligence and its entire memory uh, augmenting yours. And I think it's the combination of those two things that give it such immediate practical payoff. If I query um, GPT-4 and you query it, does it get the same answer? No. Uh, and in fact, if you query it twice, you'll get two different answers. Correct. So, you know, one of the parts that's interesting about it for me is that, you know, I, if you and I were to become friends, let's say we had well, we are friends, Mark, but you know, better friends. So let's say we had we had coffee every other week. And I'd know a lot about you after a while, and you'd know a lot about me. And, you know, if I saw a poem or something weird or strange that I thought you would like, I, I could start to figure out what that is. And it, it doesn't do that yet, as far as I understand. Is that correct? It, you, you mean you mean learn about you over time? 
And what I love, there's no, I don't get to tell it, gee, that was fabulous. Do more like that. I can't, I can say do more like that, or I can say make it funnier or all kinds of fun, you know, make it sappier, make it more uh, cynical if I ask it to write a poem. But it, it doesn't learn what I love. It will, though, I assume. Yeah, so there's a distinction in the technology between what's called the training data, um, which is the data that's used to train the network uh, to do what it does. And then there's something else called the context window, which is basically all of the inputs in that moment um, that are sort of used to kind of steer the neural network to deliver the results that, that, that the user wants. Um, today, if today, today, if you're in a single session and you use it, you know, if you're in a single window, and you use it to ask it 20 different things, it, it's sort of, it's building up what's known as its context window. It's learning about you in that session. Uh, and, and you know this because it actually exhibits state across queries, right? And so you can ask it things like, you know, give me 10 great, you know, books to read. And then, and then in the next query, you can say, give me 10 more. And you don't have to say 10 more books to read because it knows that that's what you're referring to. So, so it's building up the context window across those queries. Um, the problem is today that that, that context window is limited. Um, and then when you open up a new physical window on your screen, it, it loads, it starts the context window over again from scratch. And then it's learning from you again, as if it met you for the first time. T today, those are separate concepts. Obviously, one of there's there's a cut. It's a term we use as sort of the, the trillion dollar question, which is to say, if somebody were to solve the following problem, they would have the opportunity to create a trillion dollar company around it. One of those obvious trillion dollar questions is, boy, you want it to actually merge those concepts. You want it to learn about people um, in real time. Um, and you want it to, ba to basically be able to, re you, you want the neural network itself to be getting retrained live on the fly um, as users interact with it. Um, there's a huge amount of technical work going into that kind of thing, that, that, that kind of idea right now. Um, I'm pretty confident within, call it two years, um, that will be a solved problem. And it will, it, we, you will just come to expect that you have, you know, a relationship with these things that last many years. And it does exactly as, as you described it. It learns all about you. And you said that you listened to my interview with Tyler Cowan. So I don't really know whether you did, whether you read the transcript, or whether you put the transcript through ChatGPT. And soon, of course, you won't have to put the transcript. You'll, there'll be other queries and ways to get at that. Is there going to be a way to authenticate those claims in any meaningful way? You know, I didn't oh. use this. This was actually me. Or I oh. didn't – go ahead. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, well, this this comes up a couple different a couple different ways. So one is, yeah, authenticating that a person is actually a person and not a bot masquerading as a person. So that's sort of a, a, a identification of an individual. And then there's a related concept, which is this is actually a, you know, this is actually a true piece of content, right? Which is to say, or like so, so legitimate and valid. Uh, truth may be a separate issue, uh, but let's say legitimate and valid, right? So or real, right? Um, and so this is a true clip of Joe Biden speaking as opposed to something that's been deep faked or something like that. So we can say authentic, authenticating or verifying in, uh, people and, and, and content. Um, yeah, so this is, this is another one of these kind of trillion dollar problems, uh, trillion dollar opportunities. Um, the way that we think that the, the way that this should be, <laughs> logically, technically, there's two ways to solve this. Uh, one would be to have a centralized, basically, database. Um, and, 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 you know, if the government were to run it, we would call it the Ministry of Truth. Um, we probably don't want that. Um, and so and so maybe maybe it's a private it's a private database it's like you know the equivalent of like a fico score database or something like that right for you know for um you know for for claims like this uh, we would propose the right way to solve this is in a decentralized way kind of consistent with how the internet works um and and, and to to have you not have to trust a single entity and so we we would propose that this should be solved with um blockchain based uh, solutions um such that you should be able basically as a user you should be able to crypto cryptographically verify your identity um you should be able to cryptographically register content um you know basically based on your identity you should then be able to endorse specific pieces of content. And so Joe Biden should be able to have a cryptographic signature. Joe Biden should then be able to use that cryptographic signature to sign pieces of content, like legitimate video clips. And then if you as a user are watching a video clip and Joe Biden falls over on stage, you can check to see whether that cryptographic signature matches. And if it doesn't, you know that that, you know, is a piece of content that you shouldn't trust. There's a there's a there's an issue on this, which is the U.S. government right now is both very alarmed about this problem of potential deep fakes, and then they're also trying to outlaw blockchains. Um, and so they 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 are simultaneously trying to basically get us to solve this problem and trying to prevent us from doing so. Um, and if if you can explain to me why the government does things like this, I, <laughs> I will. Oh, that's I will. easy. They do it all the time. They subsidize tobacco, and then they tell you you shouldn't smoke it. <laughs> in exactly. The, so, in the old days. 
Yeah, so there, there's a practical issue there, but that but that that would be the solution, and that and that is what we're heading for. And, and by the way, and that's a good idea in general because look, there are there there is there are plenty of scams and fraud. You know, there's there were plenty of scams and fraud before AI, um, and so it would be good to have a general solution for this kind of thing um, that um, uh, you know gives people the ability to, to kind of ex you know sort of exercise control and verification on, on these technologies. You said you you applied to use it a lot in everyday life to make yourself more productive. I use it for, uh, to stay abreast of what's going on in the world. I've used it a few times. I used it at a birthday party the other night um, and wrote a poem for the uh, a, an older person who'd never used chat GPT. And it was fun to stun her with, it was a pretty good poem. It was nice. And it had some details about her that I had fed into it. And it touched her, which was cool because she knew I didn't write it. I didn't pretend I wrote it. Uh, but how do you use it if you could reveal to, to a little bit of that? How is it useful to you practically? Yeah, so what I'm finding is I'm actually having to kind of retrain my brain in real time to realize that it's available to me, right, whenever I need it. And so I've just, yeah, I mean, it's, it's typically in the context. I've, I'm reading some paper. There's some concept I don't understand. You know, normally, you know, what would you do normally? It's like, okay, you'd like go do, you, you hopefully by this time would have retrained yourself to do a Google search. Um, uh, and then you'd, you'd, you'd basically follow the 10 blue links and you'd look for a good explanation. And you'd, you'd hope, of course, you'd hope that you find something, you know, good. And sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. You know, here you can just say, "Look, explain it to me." Um, and, you know, you just say, you just "Tell you know whatever the uh, GPT or whatever, explain it to me." And then, and then it's you know, it's very fascinating what you can do from there because it's like, "Explain it, okay? I didn't understand that. Okay, explain it to me like I'm ten, right?" And then it simplifies it down. And then if you still don't understand it, you can say, "Explain it to me like I'm five. <laughs> and then it simplifies it down. And actually, a fun thing you can do to play with is you can say, "Take a very complex topic and kind of ladder, ladder it down like this," and then you can get it the way you can explain it to me like I'm two, um, and, and it will actually do it like. <laughs> actually translate it into the kind of conversation you can have so it's very entertaining like i'm very entertaining to have it like explain quantum physics to you like you're a two-year-old i finally feel like i'm starting to understand these things um you know look so 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 there's that um i ask it a lot i ask it for, i ask it for a lot i think in terms of lists so i ask it for a lot of lists um you know so give me 10 examples of xyz i i mentioned the very beginning i used it actually when i wrote when i wrote the essay because i i mentioned at the beginning you know human intelligence gives you better you know out, better better um uh, is life outcomes in all these different areas and i have read a lot of those papers over the years but i i don't have like a I don't have like a file of those papers. I never, I never wrote them, you know, I never kept track. And so I just said, you know, I actually told it, I said, give me 50, give me 50 life out, you know, give me 50 basically life outcomes that are improved with human intelligence and give me the citations. Um, and then, it, and then it did, and then it actually did that. Um, and then, you know, and then you, you still have, we could talk about this. You still have an obligation to cross check the citations, but the, it, it gave me I was going to mention exact. that it's, it's famously made up citations. Yeah, it, it will. And we, we can we can talk about that. But in this case, it didn't. And it gave me like very, very good results. And, and it literally gave me a list of 50. Like it was. And, and by the way, and one of the fun things on it is it'll just keep going. Right. And so it gave me 50. If I ask for 50 more, it'll give me 50 more. And it'll it'll little, you know, because it has because it has crystallized intelligence, it has all this data. It, you know, it's able to basically be extremely comprehensive. Uh, it's also, by the way, very good at compare and contrast um, on, on different topics. And so if you have two different concepts you're working with and you think they're kind of the same, but maybe not completely, you can tell, you know, say, give, give me the difference. Um, another thing I use it for is if it's a particularly, um, you know, sort of complex topic, I'll say basically um, you can you can sort of tell it to adopt personas. Um, and so I can say, you know, adopt the persona of the world's leading expert in this. Or by the way, you can say adopt the persona of an expert in a different field and then explain this to me and they'll explain it to me from the perspective of that other field. Right. So explain, you know, for example, explain human intelligence to me as a neurologist, you know, as a, as a as an expert in neurochemistry versus, a, you know, a psychologist. It'll give you it'll give you different answers. Um, and so, um, yeah, you can just like, it's, it's the ultimate, you know, it's the ultimate, it's the ultimate thought partner. Um, and I, in it, I think an incredibly compelling way. So, you know, I, I've been pretty disappointed in that I asked it to write a poem in the style of Billy Collins and it just gives me Dr. Seuss, but it will get, I assume better. It's great. Dr. Seuss, by the way, uh, I enjoy it very much, but, uh, clearly that, that needs to be improved. Um, you know, Mark, you could have a lot of followers on Twitter if you, posted some of those ideas you know you put so, a thread i mean i don't mean to <laughs> anyway um, so one of the things one of the things you can do for the ones that have internet access uh so for the the bing one that has internet access uh you can say basically write in the style of this the following twitter account and you can give it the, the handle of a twitter account and it will then adopt the persona of the person behind that account um and if you do it for yourself you can you, yes you, you could hypothetically use it to write your own tweets which of course i've never done but one could do I hope not. I, what I like is uh, someone I hope will put all the uh, EconTalk transcripts into uh, ChatGPT and let me interview Adam Smith. 
Yeah, exactly. Which would, would be lovely. Um, yeah. And that all, obviously all that's coming. And also, you know, any viewer can star in any movie they want. They'll, they can remake a movie with, instead of Harrison Ford as uh, Indiana Jones, you can, you can pick your own character, including yourself. So there's just some extraordinary things coming. I, I, I want to challenge this claim uh, that intelligence makes everything better. I, sure. do, would you really believe that the higher the IQ, I, 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 what I'm going to challenge here is the, is the linearity of it. Would you really argue that a higher IQ person makes a better parent? I, I wouldn't. I mean, you, let me start by saying again, I'm, I'm not a utopian and, and things are overdetermined. And, and, and look, when, when, when IQ is linked causatively to things, uh, you know, either correlated or, or, or causally linked to things, you know, typically in the literature, it's like a 0. 0.4, 0. 0.5 correlation. Um, and, and of course, you know this, but like the significance of a 0. 0.4, 0. 0.5 correlation, there's two ways to look at that, which is, wow, that's half or less than half, right, of, of, of the cause, which is true. But the other way you can look at it is in the social sciences, those are monster numbers. Yeah. Right, like, right, right, like almost nothing is forty percent, you know, causative on anything other, you know, out of out of a very small number of exceptions. And this is one, one of the few exceptions. Go ahead. No, I I just challenge that because uh, most of these things I don't think better is well defined. I don't even know what a better parent is. And I would at one point I think in your essay you talk about mentoring and how a chat GPT could be an amazing tutor. You just gave some wonderful examples. It obviously could be a mentor. It could help you make decisions or could help you think about how to make decisions. I think is I don't expect it to be very good at making decisions where there's serious trade-offs. And I think the I do. Okay, well let me let me say why I don't and then you can you can respond. Yeah. Uh Thomas Sowell who you mentioned earlier, said, I think, I always confuse it whether it's George Sigler or Thomas Sowell. Would a listener please get this straight for me? And it's not going to be chat GPT, but uh, Sowell studied with Stigler, so it's tricky. But uh, in economics, we say there are no solutions, only trade-offs. So, you know, solving world poverty or deciding, a better way to say it, what's the shortest distance between two points if there's no traffic? Ways is in Google Maps are phenomenal, and they're really phenomenal when there is traffic. But they're not so good, and they don't try to say answer questions like, uh, "I'm going to would I be happier doing uh, this tonight or that?" Because I don't know how there's uncertainty about whether I'm going to enjoy it or not. But more importantly, I might not be in the mood. And it doesn't know that da those data, and there's a thousand things. And happier is not the only thing I care about. I might want to care about the future and investing in a concept and the whole idea that that everything can be reduced to to metrics. Find I find um, unpersuasive. Right. So how is it going to solve those? A better way to say it, there's no will of the people. So if we said, what's best for the United States or what's best for Israel or France, X policy X or policy Y? It's an unanswerable question. It's not a question of how smart you are. It's inherently unanswerable in my view. You want to challenge that? Yeah. So let's come back to the – put a pin in the better parent thing and, and the, the higher intelligence. The, the, put a pin in that and come back to that because there's some interesting okay. things I want to talk about there. But yeah, look on your specific thing. Look – I guess I would say, look, I, I again, I'm not a utopian in these things. So the way I would describe it is not so much that the machine should be so, should be solving the problem for us of like what should you know what what am I what should I do today balancing all the factors that I can't even articulate um, or what's best for the United States like I like I I'm not proposing that that's the answer. I'm not proposing we turn over you know our society here our lives to you know to AIs and let them make those decisions. In, in fact, I, I would argue the opposite, which is these are machines. Um, like I would very, very practical answer. These are machines. Like machines, we should use them to offload all the work that we can offload onto them so that we can spend our time on the bigger questions, right? Um, and so to the extent that we have a machine that can take a lot, you know, what's the historical role of machinery in life? To take the drudgery out of life, right? It's like translate, you know, sort of offload onto the machine the thing that the person literally, you know, should not ultimately be doing so that the person could do something more useful, more valuable, more productive, more satisfying. Um, and so I, I think the way to think about the way to think about this, I think, is this is quote unquote just another machine. It's a it's a new kind of machine. It's more sophisticated than the ones we've had before. We should offload many things on it that we can precisely so that we have more time uh, for the bigger questions that you described. Um, and, and then, by the way, on those bigger questions, we can use this machine as a thought partner, right? And and it, for example, as it builds up information about about our, ourselves as individuals or ourselves as a society, it will have better and better ideas. But we but we should be in charge of the result. We should decide how to apply that. And in the ideal scenario, we have much more time and energy to be able to actually go after those those really big, important questions. So one of my favorite parts of your essay is where you explain why chat GP, uh, artificial intelligence is, is not going to run amok. Uh, 
Uh, I had Eliezer Yudkowsky on, you know, what his position, I'm sure. He's not alone. Numerous people have raised a frightening uh, scenario that that artificial intelligence will develop goals, e- one of two scenarios. Either we'll tell it to do something and it will pursue it so doggedly that it will harvest my kidneys for to make more paper clips, or it will suddenly develop desires that I didn't put into it because it will, like all intelligence, it will have other things that crosses its mind, is the claim, and it will so in, that will include domination, and it will uh, get me out of the picture. It'll it'll be the equivalent, as Eric Hole pointed out, of Neanderthal man inviting a Homo sapien into the circle the campfire and saying, "Hey, you're smarter than us. Can you help us learn some things we don't know already?" And instead, they go extinct. Why are you unconvinced by those fears? Yeah, so I think there's two kind of recurrent patterns in how people think about these things. And we'll, we'll introduce two, two large words to talk about it. So what, one is anthropomorphizing, um, right? And so there's this like long-seated kind of tendency on the part of human beings to sort of impute human behavior into things that are actually not human. And of course, this is a long tradition and, you know, in many, in, in many mythologies and in, in many religions. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's one of these things where it's, it's seemingly irrational, but, you know, of course, it probably makes some evolutionary sense because you want to <laughs> like... Right. You want to like not take the chance. Right. Yeah. Right. And um, it's fun and- to be af- it's fun to be afraid if it doesn't actually get you. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, horror movies, right? Like, you, yeah, you want to, you know, you, you, if you, if you, uh, if you hypothesize the terrible scenario, maybe, you, maybe you can, maybe you can avoid it, um, and then, um, or at least, you know, come to, come to, come to terms with it. Um, and then the, the other concept is, you know, what's what's called millenarianism, um, which is uh, basically the you know, the tendency to form a, apocalyptic uh, cults, uh, apocalyptic religions. And you know, there, there's a sort of a long tradition in, in, in sort of Christian and Christian derived cultures. There's a long tradition of millenarian apocalypse cults. Um, you know, many, many of which became very famous because they either killed a lot of people or they all committed suicide. And so you've had everything from the People's Temple to the Manson Cult to Heaven's Gate and you know, many, many others. And of course, California in particular, we are very famous for our cults. Uh, we have many thousands of cults at any point in time. Um, and, you know, most of them end fine. You know, people just go off in the woods or whatever and do whatever they do. Every once in a while, they end in madness and death. Uh, and the concern with the cult always is that they are going to tilt, you know, full on apocalyptic and actually take their own you know, predictions seriously and actually act on them. Um, and so I, th- I think what you have is you have a generation of uh, it goes back to your point on, on IQ. You have a generation of extremely smart people who have kind of thought themselves um, into an apocalypse cult, um, and it's a it's a it's an apocalypse cult that anthropomorphizes, and so it reads into machines things that aren't there, um, and then it sort of applies from that. Therefore, the end of the world. Um, and, and I, and I think, and we could go through this in detail, but I think like all the claims that you just described, like, I think they all kind of have this characteristic, which is like, okay, we have this relatively pedestrian starting point in terms of what technology can do. We are not going to hypothesize a series of kind of abstracted breakthroughs that are going to result in quite literally, right. Self-aware machines ultimately deciding to kill humanity. I I think it's, these are fundamentally religious claims. Um, I think that, you know, generally in life, making up your own religion is a bad idea. Um, generally in life, becoming a member of an apocalypse cult is a bad idea. Um, by the way, I would not criticize them in this way if they were not tripping the line into, into advocating for actual real world violence, um, which, which is what's actually now happening, which is, um, you know, people like the ones that you mentioned are now advocating for real world violence up to and including things like airstrikes and data centers um, and even potentially nuclear war, uh, you know, to, uh, to offset the risk of, of a runaway AI in, in, in another country. And I, and I think at, at the point where people are calling for that level of, of real world violence, we have to actually call it uh, what it is, which is a, an irrational apocalypse cult. Uh, you know, I assume you know some of these people personally. Even I do. At least I've interviewed a few of them. Um, and we might make a distinction. I'll let you bring it up. Uh, bootleggers and Baptists, which you talk a lot about on this program. Self-interested people who find alarmism profitable versus people who have a altruistic desire to save humanity. Right. And we don't have to name names about who's on which side or where. But it's clear that some regulation... Uh, of this might help entrenched participants. Uh, But let's take the so-called Baptists, the good-hearted people who actually are not going to profit from this personally, at least in a financial sense. They may profit from it in other ways. Uh, Reputation, esteem, people pay attention to them. But if we talk about the the, – if we take them as altruistic, uh, they're smart people, and and you're assuming that they've worked themselves up into a fever – over something that is it? Do you put z- zero probability on it? For example, uh, you're digging a, a trench and I'm digging a trench. You're using your hands. I got a shovel. 
And you say, well, I'm not using a shovel because the shovel's a tool that could run amok. And I'll say, I'm not worried about it. And we could go up to a steam engine. I'm still not worried about it. They, why is it that they think this tool is not like a steam engine? Why do they believe, at least as, in, as best as you understand it, why they think sentience, which I think is the key part here in agency, is going to emerge unexpectedly? Uh, so this goes back. Th th this, this to me is sort of the sleight of hand at the, at the core of all of this, or kind of let's, let's say the leap. I think it's the sleight of hand, but it's, let's say it's the it's the conceptual leap that they're willing to take. Um, and so the, 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 this conceptual leap is derived. The intellectual lineage of this conceptual and the leap basically is exactly as you said, which is you're going to have a system that is going to get is that's going to be a mechanistic system that's going to be designed by people that's going to run in predictable ways, and then at some point, whatever you call it, sentient self awareness, a mind of its own, its own goals are going to emerge. Right. So they, what they basically have proposed is there's an emergent phenomenon. Um, the intellectual lineage of that is is probably it's uh, probably Werner Vinge um, was the origin of this with his idea of the singularity, uh, which I think goes back to the 1970s. And the singularity was 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 this idea. The singularity is at some point computers get so sophisticated that they'll be basically more sophisticated than the human brain. At that point, they will be so much smarter than we are that they will they will develop in unpredictable ways. And we can't, you know, a, a dumber, a dumber person or thing cannot model a smarter person or thing. And so at that point, they're in charge of history with a capital H and, and, and we're not. Um, Ray Kurzweil, you know, kind of applied that to the next level, applied that specifically to AI. Um, and, you know, he has all these charts of the exponential takeoff of, you know, the sort of neural equivalent circuitry of a chip. And at some point it passes human, you know, at some point the chip is more complex than an individual human brain. And then on his charts at some point, you know, a single chip is more complex than all human brains. And then he has these sort of singularity breakthrough moments. Um, so, so that, that's I think the origin. Again, this this maps exactly to the this maps exactly to sort of Gnostic millenarianism. This is sort of this thing of like at, at sort of at some point there will be this utopian slash apocalyptic, basically right total transformation of society, um, right, which is either going to lead us to heaven on earth, uh, right. Um, you, you probably remember the term uh, immanentizing uh, the es the eschaton. <laughs> Yep. Do you remember, the, you remember this term? Yeah. So, uh, immanentizing the eschaton was the term people used in the 60s, 70s, 80s to describe this kind of thing, um, which basically, right, it, um, the eschaton was basically the arrival of, of, of heaven on earth. Um, immanentizing the eschaton basically meant using human faculties to bring about uh, heaven on earth. Of course, the problem with bringing about heaven on earth is you stand a pretty good chance of bringing uh, 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 hell on earth. Yep. Um, Eric Vogelin famously talked about how, you know, previous attempts to immanentize the eschaton included both communism and fascism. <laughs> right. right. And so, right. I Again, well. did not turn out well. Like th this is a this is a bad trend, right? This is a bad kind of road to go down. But this is kind of the road the road that they go down. And the reason I'm confident in calling it that is because it, it, this this singularity concept is sort of an eschaton. Like it it, it has that uh, it, it it has that flavor. Um, what I call the sleight of hand, or kind of the the move, or the or, or the fallacy, or whatever, is this idea that you get basically like this superpower. You know, you you get this kind of capability. Uh, of, again, call it sentience or, or self awareness or, or or goals or whatever. You you just get it magically out of out of emergence. Uh, or you, you just get it suddenly out of emergence. You get it without anybody actually. You get it. You get it kind of emerging, even though even though nobody today knows to, how to sit down and do that. You just kind of get it as a consequence of the of the complexity of the system. I, I mean, as as a as a I don't know philosopher or something. Maybe that's fun to think about as an engineer. I, that's not. I mean, anybody who's ever programmed a computer knows that's not how these things work. Um, and so that that's for me where it leaves the realm of practical reality and just ends up being this sort of quasi-religious fantasy. You know, Mark, I really want to believe you. Although there's part of me that doesn't. We're, we'll come back to that in a minute. But I think what they would say, partly in response to what you said, they may have other things. But you said. You know, something's behaving in predictable ways, and then it goes through emergence. It gathers some other ability or or desire. Uh, and you didn't mention what I loved about your essay is you said the human brain can do that because it's not created by humans. <laughs> it it's the result of evolutionary pressure, and it's full of urges. And um, those urges will not be present, and in, in, there's no reason to think they're present in AI. And I think it's a really the way I like to think about it is I wouldn't expect AI to be tribal. We're tribal. I like my kind. I can't help it. I may right. work against it. Being aware of it is helpful. But right. there's no reason to think that the self-driving vacuum cleaners would want to form a coalition with the self-driving cars to, I don't know, clean a city on at a higher pace. I, it just not right. doesn't seem logical to me. So that part I agree with. But the part that seems strange is that the predictable part. It's not so predictable. They don't. They claim not to understand it. Do you think that's sleight of hand to make it scarier? 
Yeah. I mean, again, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to use, I'm, this is not steel manning now. Um, <laughs> but it's just like, it's just like, it, it's this thing. Okay. It's this thing that they do. And this is, by the way, this is a classic of apocalypse cults, right? This is any apocalypse cult has this characteristic. They got a leader up in front of the cult. Um, and he says, the end of the world is coming. Right. And, 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 and a rational observer says, well, how do you know that? And, and ultimately the answer is, well, you can't rule it out right? Like I have my, you know, message from God. I got the tablets. I've got the thing. I've got the secret writing. I've got the vision, right? I've got whatever the thing is. And I claim that it's going to happen. And I claim to have a scenario for how it's going to happen. And you claim it's not going to happen. And how can you claim that? Cause you can't rule it out. And, 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 and look, and, and by the way, look, maybe it happens, right? Maybe things happen. Like, you know, maybe things happen. It's just, it very is important to very understand at the, at the point when you're engaging in that kind of rhetoric, you have left science behind. Right. And so, so let me put it, put it, put it, let me put a very direct point on this. There's no science to these claims, right? There's no, there's no testable hypothesis, right? There, there's a hypothesis. It's not testable. Um, right. It's not falsifiable, right? right? You know, what, what anybody trained in science, what do we say when we have a hypothesis that's not, that's not falsifiable? We say we, we, we're no longer, we're no longer operating in science. By the way, we also have no metric. Um, there's, you'll notice in, in, in this, if you, if you read the literature that, they, that these guys put out, you'll notice it's like they, they don't propose that there's basically something that you can track that can detect when this happens. They propose that this is like some all or nothing thing, right, that happens sure. overnight. By the way, there's a very practical objection to all this, which is kind of sometimes called the thermodynamic, thermodynamic objection, uh, which, again, sort of connects this back to reality, um, which is, you know, look, we're sitting here today, and let's say that, you know, GPT develops, you know, whatever you want to call it, a mind of, your, a mind of its own or its own goals or whatever. Like it can't get chips, right? So now it has its like evil plan to take over the world. It needs like more chips to be able to run its evil plan. Like the, Nvidia is out of chips, <laughs> right? And so like what, they what? have a story for that. They explain they'll get some poor low IQ person, not you or me, Mark, because we're too yeah. we're too smart. But they'll get a right. low IQ person, right. uh, an employee of some lower level, and they'll. Convince it to go buy chips for them, and and no, no, but the chips literally, the chips literally don't exist. Like Nvidia can't make the there's there's chip shortages all throughout the AI ecosystem. So oh, uh, well. they'll fix that. That's easy. I know. They'll, they'll, exactly. So basically, they'll get the senators thing. to vote for and the Congress people to vote for for subsidies to things that the chips need, and then in in, in a week or two, that that'll go away. And they'll, you know. So this is what's called the thermodynamic objection, which is, okay, to, to actually accomplish your, you're the AI, you're the sentient AI to accomplish your evil plan to take over the world. You need the chips, you need the electricity, right? You need to go buy the votes in Congress. You need to do this, you need to do, you need to do all of these things. And that somehow these things are going to happen basically overnight, very quickly, very easily, right? Without putting up, without putting a, Without without putting at this point, neither one of us are steel manning, by the way. But um, but but without putting a footprint into the world, right? Um, and this is this sort of you know this sort of takeoff idea. Um, and this this all happens in twenty four hours. It's like I don't know about you, but like anybody who's ever tried to get like Congress people to do anything, like it doesn't happen like that, right? Like it's like you, when, once you enter the real world of politics to get a bill passed, you don't understand, Mark. <laughs> it's so smart. This is uh, Nicholas Bostrom told me this in twenty fourteen. Yes. When I interviewed him, he said it's so smart, it'll know, it won't need to bribe Congress people, it'll, right. it'll just, it'll know how their minds work, it'll have right. all this data about you, and it'll just figure out the argument that you're a sucker for. It'll say, this is going to save your mother's life by yeah, yeah. subsidize the chips. Yeah, it will, it will be, and, you, and again, we, we, what we've left, what we've left at this point, when, when people go down this path, it's obvious, like, to me, it's obvious what's happened, which is we've left the world of science and engineering and practical reality behind. We've, we basically, we basically created a god. Uh, what do gods do is they, they, they uh, you know, they're able to uh, you know, call into being miracles, um, right? They can, they can exercise their will on the world arbitrarily. And, and at that point, we, we basically created a proxy religion. And of course, I, I can't help noting at this point that all these people are atheists, um, right? Um, and so, you know, they basically have been sitting inside their own head for their entire lives. They've completely ruled out any sort of traditional religion. There's a giant gaping hole left over, which is a, you know, standard thing that happens. Um, and they've constructed a new religion uh, around, around a new godhead. And it's just like, okay, it's fine. It's, it's fun. I mean, it, Look, it makes for great movies. Um, it just doesn't map to actually sitting down and trying to get something to work. I mean, look, I, the, the other cynical answer I could give on this is, God, God, I wish things worked like this because, like, boy, would we make a killing uh, yeah. in, the in the in the short period of time between now and the end of the world? Like, we would make a freaking fortune because, um, like, we're talking about something that could generate like infinite wealth basically on demand. And I and I, and I and I wish I could tell you we had a formula for doing that, but like, we really don't. You know what I get comfort from. When, hmm. when we go extinct, no one will be able to watch this video where we ignored the risk. So it's never really, it's okay. You know, you're, you're not going to look that, that bad. Um, that is good. Let's, let's turn to um, the less than apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic version 
You know, I mean, by the way, uh, I'm in Israel, and uh, I had to explain in, in English the other day to a native Hebrew speaker that what drinking the Kool-Aid is. Uh, this is related to apocalyptic cults. It's a very uh, arcane and and small reference that anybody can now find by just asking uh, ChatGPT to explain it to them. Uh, so what I want to turn to now is this question I think is more interesting, at least in the short run, which is, uh, is this good for us? And, and let's start with a general question. Do you believe that any technology that is not explicitly destructive, and by that I mean, say, a nuclear bomb or, or, a, um, or a virus, that, that any, any toy of which our lives are full of now as 2023 residents, that they're all good? We should allow any one of them, any company that can figure something out should do it. And anybody who wants to buy it should be able to. And that's part of the, the human experience. So I was put here again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, this is the, I'm not a utopian and I'm not, I'm not a believer in the unconstrained vision. And so I would not make an abs, I would not make an absolute statement of like all, all these things are good or even that all these things are like net positive. And, and look, there, again, there's a big part here, which is I can't predict what people are going to invent. Um, and so, you know, if somebody invents a kit for my eight year old to be able to make deadly pathogens. Like I'm probably going to, you know, hopefully not want him to buy it and use it uh, at least, you know, maybe keep it to the backyard, not bring it inside the house. Um, so, you know, look, I, I, I can't, you know, I don't want to rule anything out. I, look, having said that, I just make two points, which is historically, um, uh, all, I would say virtually all new technologies have turned out to be net, net positive, at least from where we sit today. Um, now, many of those, by the way, many of those have transformed society, right? And so there are certainly a lot of people who are on the receiving end of gunpowder who would say that it was not net transformative. But nevertheless, gunpowder is one of the things that led to societies, you know, basically growing up into the nation state that we have today. And I think most of us would be, you know, much less happy going back to the time before gunpowder and the time before large nation states. Um, and so, you know, I think on net, most of these things have been positive. I think, by the way, I think nuclear, both nuclear power has been net positive, which we could talk about. And also, I actually think nuclear weapons have been net positive, which is, you know, maybe a more aggressive claim, but I think that's also true. Um, the, the other point that I would make, um, and I know you've, you've, I'm sure you've talked about this in the past on the show, is, um, you know, th there's this question of how do you confront this question um, of, of, of a new technology and, and the sort of received wisdom in our culture today is you use something called the, preca the precautionary principle, uh, which is this concept basically that, um, you know, people, people sometimes use this explicitly, sometimes they use it implicitly, but it's basically that the burden of proof should be on the inventor of a technology that pr to prove that it's not net harmful or, 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 by the way, to prove that it's not harmful at all right before it's deployed. Um, the precautionary principle is a new idea like that, that basically is basically a new since the 1970s. Um, before the 1970s, people didn't think in those terms. They thought in the opposite terms, which is you want to identify the good uses and then you deal with the, you know, you deal with the bad kind of as they come. Uh, so, and I might describe this as like the modernist approach was focus on the positive and then deal with the negative later. The sort of postmodern or precautionary principle approach is deal with the bad things up front and then maybe you get benefits down the road. Um, I would be a very strong advocate against the precautionary principle. I would be a very strong advocate for actually the original modernist view. Um, I think we should generally proceed with an, with with, a, with at least an implicit assumption that new technologies are net positive. Um, and, and the reason for that, and again, I'd say the, the reason for that, one is there's just a lot of historical proof on that. And then the other is the process by which the precautionary principle is actually engaged with, I, I find fairly horrifying. Um, right, which is it's sort of a combination of kind of thought experiments by people that have actually a very poor predictive record. And then it invites the participation of, let's say, uh, other forces um, that are, you know, there's no reason to believe that they're going to have, you know, good decisions to be made. Um, and, and then you always have this issue with the precautionary principle of if you're if you're stalling out a new technology because you think it's it's net harmful, what you're not seeing right are all of the potential benefits that are not being realized. And the precautionary principle never takes those into account. Um, and at yeah, least I mean, historically, those those have been overwhelming. Um, it, the, the, because most technologies have been net positive, the gains that you're leaving on the table if you get conservative on these things, um, you know, you you may never see those gains because you never see them happen, but they are still net losses to society. And that's specifically the risk on AI right now, which is we're not going to get the payoff. We're not going to get the payoff because we don't get the payoff. We won't see the payoff because we won't see the payoff. We won't even be aware of what we're missing out on, um, and, but that that will still be a big net loss for society. Now, you can think of it as the difference between asking for permission and asking for forgiveness, uh, right? It, one's more optimistic than the other. But in both cases, there's the risk of the of the type one or type two error. The You miss a great technology because you fail to, fail to foresee the benefits. The worry is you might embrace a new technology because you have no chance of foreseeing the costs. The costs can also be hard to see. I, I was going to take this as an example, and I, I'm kind of torn about this. I, I, I don't 
I don't have a simple answer to this, but you know, I've mentioned this before on the program. I I really love my iPhone, um, and part of the reason I love it, Adam Smith writes about this really beautifully, strangely enough, in 1759, which is shocking, but he says, we don't really care about what things achieve. We care, often we only care about the fact that they, that they, that they serve the purpose they were designed for and they do it so well, we call that beauty. And he gives the example of a, a pocket watch that loses two minutes a day. And he says, so you pay a premium, 50, say, pounds, to get a watch that, that's more accurate. He said, but it doesn't get into your meetings on time any better than the first one did, <laughs> which is, I think is a very deep insight into, into the human experience. But part of the reason I love my iPhone is that it, that it can be done at all. I, I, there's something I find inspiring about it. I am a religious person, but as a, as a human achievement, I think it's an extraordinary thing. And I'm starting to wonder whether, you know, it was as great as I used to think it was. In term, first of all, I can see some of its harm that it's doing for me. I see harm it's potentially doing. It's a big debate, obviously, as to whether it's it's bad for children and other living things. But there's some evidence, maybe wrong, that it might be. And I and I have this thought experiment, and I'm going to give it to you, is, you know, Steve Jobs comes back, and uh, he's excited to see the number of iPhones that are out there in the world, smartphones that are competing with him from other companies. And then he gets on a train, and uh, or better yet, he's at a dinner party, and no one's talking to anybody. They're all on their phones checking their social media or wandering around on the internet. Does that worry at all? Yeah. So as you know, with these questions, there are always two-part questions, right? Which is like, one is, what do we think? How do we feel about these things? And then, of course, part two is, do we want the government taking action, right, on our behalf right, as, as a result of how we think and feel, right? So let's even conclude. Let's even grant all of your arguments. Let's, like, grant that the iPhone is doing this, that. The other is causing you to get distracted. It's, you know, degrading your real-world relationships and so forth. You know, how do you feel about the government saying, okay, fine, hand them over, right? They're no longer allowed, right? Um, or, you know, doing what they're doing in China now and saying, great, you get to use it, you know, three hours a week, Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday night between eight o'clock and nine o'clock, right? And after that, you know, it's, you know, after that, after that, you know, the secret police is going to come to your door, right? Like, so... So, 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 so I, so I think you know this, but I think you have to separate, you always have to separate, like, like in my mind, you always, you always have to separate these kind of moral ethical considerations. Um, you have to separate them from the practical results. And then, and then correspondingly, you know, how do you feel about people who, you know, by the way, you might even agree with people who might say, you know, iPhones are net negative for society. How do you feel when they start demanding regulatory changes? Right. Um, and how do you feel like when they show up at the white house and they start demanding new laws to be passed? Right. And so, 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 so this is the problem is the translation from the one into the other is let's say, let's say imprecise. Let's pick a harder, let's pick a harder version of your question though, which is nuclear power. Right. Um, and so we talked about, I, I mentioned the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle was developed by the German Greens uh, in the 1970s. And it was, you know, very associated with it was the environmental movement and it was very associated with the question of nuclear power at that time. Um, and for 50 years, you know, we've been running, you know, in the in the developed world, both the U.S. and, and throughout Europe, we've been running with this presumption, right, that nuclear energy is a, is, is is more of a threat than a benefit. Um, and we had these very, you know, well-publicized nuclear disasters like Three Mile Island early on in the field. Um, and, you know, we basically became convinced that, you know, this stuff is this nuclear power is net bad. Um, and, and, and how do you know, how do I know that we became convinced of this? Well, because if you contrast the plans at the time to what's happened, so, in fact, Richard Nixon, Richard Nixon played a key role here. Richard Nixon uh, created a project in 1972 called uh, Project Independence. Uh, he proposed building a thousand new nuclear reactors in the U.S. And, and cutting the U.S. over entirely to nuclear power, right, and making all the cars electric and like you know basically eliminating um, you know carbon emissions in the U.S. Um, so that that you know that was an interesting idea. He also created the EPA uh, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which made it their missions in life to prevent that from happening. Um, and in fact, that did not happen. Um, Europe, of course, went through a similar thing. There is a little bit of a contrast between France and the rest of uh, Europe uh, as a consequence of their they were somewhat more enthusiastic about this, but. Let's go back. That's because I like Jerry Lewis movies. I, I'm sure it's related. <laughs> Probably is. Um, they went back. Uh, well, you know, this goes. I mentioned the German Greens. This goes back to the German Greens. Germany today, right, is in a literal energy war with Russia. Right, they are literally paying Russia for oil and gas funding. Right, the invasion of Ukraine. They cannot stop paying Russia. Right. They 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 are shutting down their remaining nuclear reactors. And and you know this, but like, what are they what are they converting over to from nuclear? As they shut down the nuclear reactors, they're converting over to coal, 
um, right? Um, right. And so, so carbon emission, you know, so the, the, the German greens basically are in complete control of German policy on this. Um, and, you know, I think it's what it's the finance minister, or whatever is, 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 is one of these guys. Um, and they are basically, um, by, by being averse to nuclear power on the basis of the Proshner principle, they're flooding the atmosphere with, with, with hydrocarbons, um, you know, and, and funding the Russian invasion of Ukraine with no end in sight. And so they, they you know, again, they've like fought themselves into a corner. In the hypothetical world where they had, you know, their own project independence and they had, you know, their own whatever 300 nuclear reactors or whatever that gave them like complete, you know, completely clean, you know, uh, uh, energy sector, unlimited energy with basically, you know, that basically emits water uh, as, its, as its byproduct and a very small amount of containable nuclear waste, you know, uh, on their own criteria, right, on both of those fronts, they would be much better off. But they have, you know, they have convinced themselves that their, you know, wisdom allows them to, to see around corners in a way that's resulted in the exact opposite of what they want. And so, so to me, it's like that, that's the just like gigantic, obvious cautionary tale. Um, and that's just like so clear and vivid today. And, and the fact that the people who believe in the precautionary principle will not mark their belief to market on the basis of their experience of nuclear power to me, again, indicates that they, they, they've left science behind uh, and they're firmly in the realm of religion. So a recent episode with Jacob Howland and uh, hasn't aired yet, but, you know, he worries about whether our human skills are atrophying. As we embrace various technologies, I, I think about uh, my dad would never have bought a snowblower when we lived in Boston. He thought it was good for me to shovel the driveway. Um, he wanted me to learn how to drive a stick shift. Uh, part of that was practical, but part of it was I would call aesthetic. You know, there's something really fun about and and pleasing about controlling a car through a manual transmission as opposed to the the easier uh, version of an automatic transmission. Much of life is about overcoming challenges. And as we knock these away in the area of thinking, uh, a listener uh, asked me whether I was worried that, that we would lose some of those skills, uh, that there's a certain paternalism uh, of, of, of artificial intelligence. I thought it's an interesting idea that you know, it, it takes care of so many things for me, like a, like a parent uh, mm -hmm. looking out for me, that I don't have to think about those. And many of those things, like mentoring and Raising a child, we alluded to earlier. They're an important part of the human experience. Are we going to are we going to lose some of those skills? That's worry you at all? Well, to start with, there's this interesting phenomenon where a lot of these things become art forms, right? And so the right, so the classic example is the horse, right? So, you know, once upon a hundred years ago, right, if you were rich, you had a car. Um, if you were poor, you had a horse, right? Um, today, it's flipped. <laughs> right today, there's actually a there's a club actually in my neighborhood. Uh, I never thought I would live in a neighborhood that had this, but there's actually a, cl a club in my neighborhood that's a, that's a horse club. Um, and I take my kid over there, and we we go we go hang out and watch all watch all the horse stuff. And like it's like the richest people right in in our community who like have horses. Um, by the way, there's a blacksmith, <laughs> right? Who like actually like makes quite a good living. Yeah. Uh, right, a hundred years later, but it's it's an art form, and you know they have a horse show every every year, and they they breed the horses, and they jump the horses, and they do this and that with the horses, and it's, they they play they play polo, right? Um, and like it's you know it's an art form, um, and so and it's the same thing by the way with cars, right? It's like you know if you're super into cars, you know you will tend to own vintage cars. They'll have manual transmissions. If you're super into cars into racing, you'll you'll be racing old cars, and so you know then there's people who do that around here. They'll be driving these you know 1970s Ferraris around the track at 120 miles an hour with it with the stick shifts, and so the, you know these. these things actually survive as art forms. By the way, another uh, kind of interesting kind of take on this, right, in, in, uh, with, with an economic lens is, um, you know, handmade handmade objects end up becoming the luxury goods, right? And so, you know, the, the handmade leather shoes are much more expensive. And they brag about the fact that they, each pair has its own defects. So don't, don't be alarmed by it. That's part of the process. So, so there's there's a thing in menswear. There's a thing in menswear where if you buy a normal suit off the rack, it, it has four buttons on on the sleeve, but the buttons are stitched uh, to the. They, they don't actually open, right? Because nobody actually right. people used to actually unroll their sleeves uh, when they when they're in their suit to do work, and they don't do that anymore. And so the, the sleeves are, are visual, but they're not functional. So one of the things you get if you buy like a handmade suit, like on Savile Row, is you actually get working buttons. Um, and so you can always tell if you're in a meeting with somebody and there's like 30 people wearing suits. You can look around the room and you can spot the people who have had their suits handmade because they will have unbuttoned the top two buttons um, because they can and the people who bought the suits made by machines can't right exactly right um and then literally those people who are said wearing the show is impractical <laughs> 
<laughs> that's, 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 exactly. Uh, it's for people doing manual labor in their suits, which is not so much a thing anymore. Um, and then, yeah, those people tend to be wearing like $2,000 handmade leather shoes, right? And so so there's this thing. And by the way, it's the same thing like recorded, you know, as you say, same thing in music, right? Which is the same argument was made about music, right? Which is basically recorded music is going to basically render the art of playing music obsolete. Um, and of course, the opposite is true, which is the, the premium music experience is not listening to music on your stereo or on your on your phone. The premium experience is having the musician play for you. Right, and going to a concert or going to a party. And, and again, here you get into the thing where what, what do rich people do? They hire famous bands to come actually play. You know, they hire the Rolling Stones to come play at the kid's birthday party, right? Like that's like, you know, that's like, you know, it gets conspicuous consumption in it, but it's an aesthetic experience, right? And extraordinarily inferior to the recorded version in some dimension. Exactly, in some dimensions and very superior in others. And of course, as a human being, you you know, given the choice, you you would always pick the live performance because you're you're going to remember it as a time and place and a particular experience with other people, right? And so I I just I, I view this stuff as like no, this is not. This goes back to this sort of what's the role of mechaniz mechanization in our society? Uh, the role of mechanization in our society is to take out the drudge work, to take out the things we don't have to do. With with with, with due respect to your father, is to stop shoveling the driveway by hand, something that I yeah. myself did many times. Like your life is net improved. Most people's lives are net improved by a lot. If they're, if the snowblower lets them clear the driveway in five minutes instead of 45 minutes, they've got the other 40 minutes to spend with their kids, right? Like that is like, you know, that's more, more valuable than anything. And so that, 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 that I think is the actual practical lens that we put on these things. Again, this is not ruling out downsides and this is not ruling out, you know, different, you know, I mean, look, so Socrates famously was like opposed to, 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 lit to liter literacy. He was opposed to writing. Um, you know, for what he viewed were like very important reasons that are kind of kind of, kind of along this, this train of thought. And, you know, look, he, he probably had a point um, if you go back and look at his original arguments in terms of how culture was going to change when it went from oral to written. Um, but still, like written culture led to the creation of the Enlightenment and science and technology and everything around us today. And so, like, I, you know, big, big net positive. So my favorite thing. I think, well, I don't know, there's so many, Mark, but you've said a lot of interesting things. And one of them I really particularly like, of course, is the, which will not surprise listeners, is this idea of, do you want the government to do it? And I think, you know, I've said a thousand times on this program, and somebody could verify that if they use ChatGPT well enough, but I've said many times on this program that I would always prefer a cultural norm to emerge about how we behave. So, if it's weird that at our dinner parties or at my meetings at work, some people check their phones compulsively, by the way, not just because they have an emergency at home, but sometimes they just can't help themselves. Well, we need to develop ways for that to happen. And similarly, you could argue, well, if you're raised by a parent that didn't give you a cell phone until you were 10, which would be like unbelievably cruel in today's world, maybe you'll end up marrying some other benighted uh, person who's not just uh, you know, that's going to go along with a whole bunch of other things. And you're going to maybe interact better with that with that person on the other side who the spouse to be because they were raised in this other certain non-technological way. I mean, the Amish are an extreme version. Uh, religious people marry people like them often because for the, all kinds of reasons similar to this. I wonder if there's a way. I, I've been surprised at how little evolution of culture there has been around technology in the 10 years that it's become so central in our lives. Um, norms about how to act on social media, norms about how to treat the, the cell phone, no, norms about uh, your notifications. Say, I have this radical thing. I only get my notifications twice a day. It's a nice thing. It's pleasant. I'm glad I do it. I suspect it's unusual. What I want, if I had young kids, would I encourage them to do something similar? Yes. But a lot of these so called solutions or I would just say a richer menu of choices. Um, they don't seem to be happening. That could be because they're not, nobody wants them. <laughs> they don't speak to people. But I wonder if there's a way to make uh, this easier for people because they're using these tools in groups. So tools in groups, the reason they're, you don't want to deprive yourself of technology is you don't want to be cut out. And, and there's very few ways between off and on. Uh, there's no, there's not that much in between. Is any way we could make it? I don't know. I can't even think about it. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah. So a couple of things. So one is <laughs> good news. Apple's very focused on this. Um, and so Apple, every release now has all kinds of new features for doing all kinds of limitations. And, you know, they've got ch child control and they've got like all kinds of like self, they've got this thing, whatever screen time or whatever, where you can set all these limits. And so the, the companies are actually doing a lot of this. It's actually a good test. 
you know, <laughs> it's a good test whether anybody wants any such yeah. limitations, but they, they have the capability to do that. I mean, look, cultural norms, I think cultural norms, uh, I think that they, 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 they do, they, there is a way to do this. So we do this at our firm, which is we have certain meetings where people just, which is like everyone phones down, you know, put, put phones face down. Um, uh, uh, you know, there's another form of this uh, kind of thought process that's happening right now around a lot of companies that are trying to figure out how to work post COVID. Um, right. And so it's like, you know, what good cultural norms, what is the balance between being in the office which, versus being at home? Um, when you're at home, right, what is the expectation of your availability? Right. What, one of the criticisms of modern technology over the last decade is it tends to make a lot of white collar workplaces a 24 by 7 experience because you're expected to be online all the time. Um, but it, it, COVID has given a lot of companies that basically the and, and, and employees the ability to basically take stock of a situation like that and kind of say, what do we actually want? Um, by the way, another idea, um, and I, I tried this myself, I would say with uncertain results, but another idea is, um, you know, if you have friends uh, who observe Shabbat, um, you know, at a certain point, and you're, you know, if you're not, and you're not Jewish yourself at a certain point, you start to get jealous. Um, and you're like, wow, that sounds like that might be a pretty good idea. Um, and maybe it's even, uh, so what I'm trying to do is trying to do like between, you know, Friday night and, or, and Saturday night, or even into Sunday night, it's like, how about I just like not read the internet? How about I read like books and papers instead? You know, like it's, it's a challenge because how, like, how's that working for you? I would say media, media, media. I would say God, God is not pleased, um, but um, but that's 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 not my main goal right now. So um, you know, it's fun. I mean, it's fun. It's you know, the the idea that you go into a tunnel in which you get to spend time with you know friends and family, and you get to you know read read longer form things. Uh, you know, is enjoyable. And so, look, these are I think all absolutely fine cultural questions, societal questions. I think we should have these debate. You know, these arguments, debates. I think people should try different things. Uh, there are people in there are people in San Francisco actually doing. There's a lifestyle in San Francisco. Uh, again, we, as I said, we're famous for our cult. So there's this uh, new lifestyle in San Francisco where some people are doing what they call a dopamine fasts. Um, and so they're, they're taking it a step further, which is they're literally trying to carve out like time every week to like literally not not have a dopamine response from anything. Um, and so they're, they're, it's, it's almost a very ascetic, right. Kind of thing where it's like, not only no phones, but also no books, no TV, right. No, like, you know, stressful conversations, um, you know, basically just like go into, you know, basically go into a tunnel of like total relaxation, right. Like a Zen, like a Zen practice of some, of some kind. Um, and you know, you know, it, yeah, maybe there's, um, you know, maybe, maybe there's something to that. So look, I think these are all the kinds of questions. These are all the kinds of questions that we should be spending our time on. Like, the, you know, the questions of meaning, right? The questions of like what it means to live a good life. The questions of what it means to have a community. Like, the, these are all the great questions. And, and again, just the engineer in me can't help pointing out like the purpose of technology is to offload all of the drudge work so that we can spend our time on these questions, right? Um, it, you 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 only it was this way. You only get these questions when you have a materially wealthy society, and the wealthier the society gets, the more time you have for these questions. That's the first world problem, for sure. Yeah, that's right. Um, you're an exceptionally smart person uh, in in the fluid intelligence sense, and you also have read a lot. I'm curious how much you've read in what we would call philosophy or wisdom literature, religious work. Uh, I, I sense that, given our conversation about cults, Zen uh, attitudes – that that the culture of Silicon Valley, and we have it here in Israel, very much so, and in, in the high tech, credible high tech sector that Israel has, there is some thirst for uh, those things, for philosophy and, and religion and and other sources of wisdom outside of engineering. Do you sense that? Is that a or is that, am I imagining it? I think there definitely is. Um, I think people people who don't have that at some point realize that there's something missing. Um, the challenge is that, right, the temptation, at least in the world I'm in, the temptation is then to try to roll your own. Um, and, you know, and by the way, this is what I think the effect of altruists have, effect, have, have essentially done. This is what the AI experts people have done. This is what the rationalists have done. This is what the atheists generally do is they, they're kind of like, okay, you know, <laughs> by we default, can do this better. Well, or we can we think we can think from first principles, right? Like like everything we do in science and technology is based on thinking from first principles, and so therefore, obviously, we can do that in like religion and culture and philosophy, right? And how to live a good life, right? Um, and you know, this is this is the um, you know you know Nietzsche talked about this, right? You know, okay, God is dead. We'll never wash the blood off our hands. The, 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 like his point was, okay, like it's not so easy to create your own values. 
right? Like it was a hard won struggle over thousands of years to get to Judaism and get to Christianity and get to all of these things. Um, and, and, you know, good, bad, and different, like whatever you think of them, you know, they went through a process of winnowing, right? You know, good and bad ideas for, you know, for the, the, their Lindy, they went through a process of uh, an, ev an evolutionary process uh, for a very, very long time. And there, there are things in them where you look at them today and you're like, okay, maybe that, maybe they carry X too far. Right. <laughs> right. But, but still like on balance, they work their way through the process of, 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 of selection and, 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 and pressuring and, and, and got societies to the other side. Um, and, and, and so then it's like, okay, what are the odds that somebody who basically, and, and by the way, what are the odds that people generally who have had technical educations and have had very thin, you know, humanities educations, or, or maybe even worse have had modern humanities educations, which is maybe worse than having any worse than having no, uh, no humanities education these days. Um, uh, you know, what are the odds that they're going to sit down and construct from scratch, right? A, a complete approach to, you know, to, to well, fundamentally to philosophy and ultimately, ultimately, ultimately to life. And, and, you know, I just think I would say number one, the odds of that are are very poor. Um, uh, and then I would just say like, number two, what, what, what tends to happen, I think, at least my reading of it was tends to happen is they don't actually construct the new ideas. They think they're constructing what they tend to do is they tend to, they tend to construct an ersatz version of, of what they inherited culturally. And, and in particular in our society, they generally, they tend to uh, assemble sort of a proxy Christianity. Um, and they, they would never, they would never admit this or, and, and generally they will argue vigorously against it, but generally they, 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 um, uh, you know, they're creating a sort of a, a fake version of Christianity. And, and then, and then you just have to ask the question and I, I'm not, I'm not a religious person, but like, you have to ask the question of like, okay, like what, what is your confidence level that that's actually going to lead to better outcomes? And again, that's where I think there's this risk of like drifting off into cult territory, because if you're ungrounded in your construction of new values and you're doing it from scratch and you're very thinly educated on how people have done this in the past, like, it's just hard to see how it goes well. Uh, very reminiscent of uh, John Gray's seven types or seven kinds of atheism, which I interviewed him about. I apologize to listeners. It wasn't a very good quality conversation. He did it over uh, a phone. Uh, he didn't have many other technologies, but he has a lot of insight. And it's uh, so if you can put up with the mediocre audio quality, it's it's an interesting conversation I had with him a long time ago. Let's close talking about national policy. Which you touch on in the essay, and uh, you may know better than I do that in my conversation with Tyler, I think he asked whether Israel is going to develop its own uh, AI policy or suggesting it should. And Bibi Netanyahu recently said Israel will be a leader in this area, and I don't know what that means. I think it will be no matter what, but whether he meant it should have a national arsenal. I don't even know what it what it would mean at a national level, but your point is that even if many countries decide that there is an existential risk here, there are other countries that won't. And it reminds me of my one of my favorite poems. Uh, it's by Hiller Belloc called Pacifism. It says, um, pale Ebenezer thought it wrong to fight, but roaring Bill who killed him thought it right. So that's it. And the poem. So if, you know, if, if America is convinced by these, uh, the warriors, the doomsdayers, that it's a bad idea, China's not worried about it. They're going full stream ahead. So is it important that other multiple sources of this technology get developed in parallel? Um, are people going to get ahead or behind? How much do you think it's going to be open source so that uh, anybody can use it as a tool at a very primitive level? And then to all the power and profit, which you, of course, are going to look at, is going to come from making it user friendly. Yeah. Well, look, so yeah, so first the race is on, um, right? And so the, the, the race is on, the race is on, you know, within the within the U.S., um, the race is on, you know, outside the U.S., the race is on with China. Um, um, all those things are true. Um, the Ch Actually, China, they, they just dropped a, uh, a paper on a, a model that they built, um, which is sort of, uh, it's close to GPT-4 quality. They're coming up the curve quickly. Um, yeah, you'll enjoy this. Um, one of the things that uh, OpenAI does when they release a new version of GPT is they run standard, they run all the sort of standardized exams. They, they run all the standardized exams you're no longer allowed to use for college admissions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and they run them through GPT, right? Um, and so, uh, and, and that's how, that's by the way, that's how I, that's how I think you can approximate the IQ of these systems is because these are all kind of IQ tests uh, for the most part, but, um, but they, they run these exams through. And so you can see OpenAI publishes in their, their, their papers, they publish like, here's how it scored on the SAT and the ACT and so forth. Um, so China just did this, but they ran the Chinese, you know, state exams, you know, through, through their system. And of course, you know, that, that, that includes sections on Marxism. Um, and uh, Mao Zedong thought, right, and Xi Jinping thought, and it, of course, it turns out the Chinese LLM is like really, really good at Marxism, uh, and, and Xi, Xi Jinping thought, right? 
and, and right. And so like, you're, you're going to have like, you're, yeah, there, look, you're going to have Chinese AI. Um, uh, it's going to be like, it's going to be communist AI. Um, like it's, it's going to happen. Um, by the way, if you know, the Soviets actually tried to do this like 50 years ago, there was a big cybernetics program in the Soviet Union to try to build Soviet AI. Like that didn't work. Um, the Chinese have certain advantages today, including let's just say access to IP, uh, from the U S and so they're, 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 they're coming up the curve quickly. And of course they have a lot of scientists and engineers to work on this. Um, and then in, in all seriousness, they, they have published a roadmap for what they plan to do. Um, they, they what's called their 2025 plan and the digital Silk Road. Um, and their roadmap is exactly what you'd expect, which is the Chinese Communist Party expects to use AI for authoritarian population control inside China. Um, and then they plan to use it as a carrier of Chinese values in the Chinese system and Chinese assumptions about how society should be ordered and to take that around the world. Um, and they plan to roll that out as a requirement on top of their, you know, Silk Road investment program. They tend to roll that out as a technological layer on top of their 5G networks that they've spread all over the world. Um, and so they, they have a vision for the use of AI that's very authoritarian, and they have an agenda to spread this as far and wide as possible. Um, and so, you know, we are like it or not in a new Cold War dynamic. Um, and th this is, you know, this is going to be one of the key technologies that's going to influence the shape of the world for, you know, for hundreds of years to, to, to come. Um, you know, there's this fascinating phenomenon that happens when I talk to people in Washington, which is, which I experience as sort of schizophrenia, uh, which is as long as we're not talking about China, their conversation is entirely about how to regulate slash punish the American tech industry. Um, whenever China comes up, the conversation changes completely. Um, and you know, it's like the old, you know, me against my brother, me and my brother against my cousin, you know, kind of thing, which is all of a sudden it becomes a conversation about how to, how to contain and ultimately defeat the Chinese vision. Like, I, I think it's going to happen. The, the the general tensions between the countries are ramping quickly um, and between the systems are ramping quickly. And so my, my guess is within a couple of years, the dominant discussion here is going to be the you know U.S. or the West v. China. Um, but we're, we're still in this schizophrenic state where people are not quite clear on this. And I, and I think that's something that people should think very hard about. Should a country like Israel, to quote, develop its own? I'm not even sure what that means. What would that mean and should it? So, well, there's two, when, when, so when a national leader says a, a country wants to be a leader in X, they mean one of two things. They either mean they want to do it really well or they want to regulate it out of existence, right? Um, and so the EU has decided that they want to be the world leader in regulating AI. Um, and they have a law that looks like it may pass as soon as October that effectively bans AI inside the EU. So, so that's one form of, le of leadership. Um, probably that's not what Netanyahu has in mind. Um, he, he probably is a more, more practical guy um, and probably um, wants to, you know, Israel to be a technology leader, which Israel is in many other areas of technology. Um, well, look, I mean, look, Israel has a very good shot at doing whatever it puts its mind to. And, you know, a lot of the best and brightest, you know, Silicon Valley engineers are, are you know, either are, are Israeli in here or, or are, you know, uh, Israelis in Israel working, working, you know, with, with companies that we're involved in. So, you know, Israel has as good a shot as, as any country um, at being a real leader in this. Um, and it's a good, I think it's a good idea to, to put a real focus on this. Um, there is a challenge, which is there is a critical mass of AI development basically in two places in the world. Um, and those places are the U S and China. Um, uh, and then, and then within the U S it, it is incredibly concentrated into the San Francisco Bay area. Um, and, and I actually say that usually when I say that, it sounds like I'm a booster, um, for where I happen to live. But in, in this case, I actually think it's concentrated to actually a quite extreme degree and to a degree that's probably not healthy. Um, but it's just, it just literally is the fact that like 99% of the development is happening in the San Francisco Bay area. And, and that's a consequence, by the way, of the existence of Stanford and Berkeley. Um, and then, um, also, uh, Google and, and, and Facebook and Microsoft, um, all their labs that have been working on this for the last, you know, whatever, forever decades. Um, it, you know, it's, it's basically been, been here. And so, the, so, so the critical mass is in the San Francisco Bay area. And so basically, practically speaking, you've got the San Francisco Bay area and then Beijing, uh, Shanghai. Uh, is overwhelmingly where the development is. And so, and, and again, this goes back to the China thing, which is that, that I, there, for better or for worse, there is a Cold War dynamic developing. It is a bipolar dynamic. Um, you know, I think countries like Israel, they will have their own capabilities, but a lot of what they will have, I think, is going to be U.S. derived. Um, and then, and then correspondingly, there are many other countries around the world that are going to have to make a fundamental choice. Um, and, and, you know, this is a very similar choice that they make in trade policy. It's a very similar choice they make with when they decide to build 5G networks. And it's going to be a really important choice here, which is fundamentally, uh, if you, you know, take, take your pick of country. But if you are anybody from Germany to, you know, Argentina to, you know, to, to uh, South Africa to Indonesia, you're, you're going to have to decide fundamentally, are we making a U.S. bet or a China bet? 
Um, and, you know, generally, generally, <laughs> you know, freedom oriented regimes, uh, I think are going to generally want to make the US bet um, authoritarian oriented regimes are going to be tempted to the China path, which bet you take is going to help tilt your political system in the future, because this technology is going to help shape the politics, right, of, uh, and the culture of then what happens in your country. And so we're, we're, we're back to one of those moments, like, you know, whatever, in the 1970s with the Soviet Union, where they're like, there, there are there are a choice of two systems, and there are temptations down both paths. Um, and people are going to be making decisions. And I, and I, and I think that's the, to my mind, that's the adult conversation um, that has to happen. And that's the adult policymaking process that has to happen, uh, certainly in the US, but also in many other countries. My guest today has been Mark Andreessen. Mark, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Good. Thank you, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.